Hi, everyone. My name is Colin Allard. I'm a professor of psychology from the University of Waterloo. And I've been bombarded so, by so much great stuff over the last couple of days that I, I can't really remember what I do anymore. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to try. I've got 10 minutes to reconstruct it. So let's see what happens. Um, I, uh, I think that I first saw one of Philip and his team's creations something like around 10 years ago, maybe a little bit less than that. And it, even though the piece that I saw was fairly small, I remember my, my first and overwhelming sensation being one of um, fascination and peace, relaxation. So um, I haven't had much luck with, with short talks lately. Um, I've gone over time a lot, so I thought I'd start at the end and give you the take home message. And because I figured otherwise you wouldn't see this slide. So, so here it is. I think we're predisposed to, to recognize and to like life and that this sort of bedrock, this existential bedrock explains a lot of things. It explains, for example, part of my reaction to um, the, the, the Beasley team's uh, creations, why people line up for hours to look at these things, and I've seen that happen. Uh, more than once, why nature heals, and by that I mean, in this case, psychologically, uh, maybe what makes a good city and lots of other stuff as well. So to start off with, um, I heard a complaint, maybe it wasn't a complaint, but I think Axel mentioned earlier that there wasn't enough anthropomorphism. So this is, this is actually octopomorphism, I suppose, but let's, let's start here. Um, here's another one. Um, had enough? Maybe not. Here's some more. Here's some more. So you're, you're laughing um, because you're experiencing a very common human response to seeing images that make you, um, that remind you of faces. Um, and we see these kinds of things all the time. I'm sure that you've seen them before. They make fun internet memes. Um, that's most often, I think, where I see them. But there's something a little bit more profound that underlies this, and it has to do with a piece of your brain um, that I'm showing here. Th there's actually a part of your brain called the fusiform face area that we think is specialized for processing information about faces. And it makes sense that we'd have something like that, because as we all know, understanding faces, recognizing faces, and also being able to understand facial expressions is an incredibly important part of being a human being. And so it makes sense that we're specialized for that. I think that what these fun phenomena maybe are suggesting is that when we look at other kinds of objects in the environment, we take that device that's here in our brains and we point it at any kind of object. So there might be expected to be circumstances where we would look at something in the world, perhaps a piece of architecture, really anything, and use this specialized hardware that we have for recognizing faces to do stuff with that. Um, there's actually, I don't have any slides of his work, but there's a, a, a fascinating piece of work by uh, someone named Michael Ostfold in Australia who has taken this idea a little bit farther by um, taking, um, these days it's not hard to find computer algorithms for, that you can point at objects and have them interpret the facial, ex facial expressions of objects. Um, so Ostwald had the idea of pointing this algorithm at other kinds of objects in the world, arguing that there's always going to be an output, and that output is going to tell you something about a facial expression, even if it's something that's not a face. Um, Ostwald pointed his algorithm at um, architectural objects, and you might be interested to know, we just saw, Sarah just showed, um, I, th I think, a Le Corbusier um, construction. Um, one of Ostwald's findings was that Le Corbusier's um, architecture was angrier than Frank Lloyd Wright's architecture. At, at any rate, um, um, this is one example, I think, of how we might be specialized for, um, uh, for detecting and interpreting vitalism. Um, here, a couple of things on this slide. First of all, uh, a book cover by uh, somebody named Harry Francis Mulgrave, a noted architectural historian and theorist who talks about um, the new science of, in this book, the new science of embodiment and its relationship to architecture. Um, the picture that you see here is of a ciborium. I'm sorry, I forget where this is, but it's a ciborium that you notice it has these, these beautifully um, twisted columns. 
And so in the book, Malgrave talks about the fact that when we see these twisted columns, we can almost feel the gut-twisting emotional impact of this structure. And his argument, again, is that we are embodying this architectural object in a way that makes sense for us as an animal that's specialized for detecting the emotional state of others. In other words, we're empathic. Um, and this has been a big move in psychology in the last um, decade or two. Um, the idea that um, we are not brains in vats. There was this old idea in psychology that we were, uh, we were these um, um, d dynamically um, cognitive creatures we, we thought, we perceived, and we had to beat down the, the, the seeming underbelly, the, the so-called reptilian brain that contained all of our emotions. That was the enemy. And there's been this huge transformation in the way that we think about the relationship between emotions and cognition, so that now we recognize that our emotional state needs to constitute an important part of a healthy and adaptive approach to um, understanding who we are in the world. Okay, so now this is, um, hopefully this will work. Where is there? Let's try this video. I suspect that that you've all seen stuff like this before. It's a point dot display. Um, this was an, invented by um, a fantastic psychologist named Gunnar Johansson uh, quite some time ago, where, when the only way to produce displays like this was to, um, um, three minutes, I'm nowhere yet. See, I'm glad that I showed the take home message. Um, Gunnar Johansson uh, did this in, with old school methods attaching lights to people's bodies, and now we have different ways of doing this. So um, the, uh, the, the point here is, is that just as with detection of faces, we have specialized hardware for detecting what's called biological motion. In this case, the superior temporal sulcus, as is shown here. I'm going to speed up a little bit and say nothing else about that, but move on to nature, because that's really the thing that I want to talk about the most. Um, so here's an image of nature. Everybody here has had the experience of what psychologists like to call the restorative response. That is, when we immerse ourselves in nature, we feel its effects. We feel relaxation. We feel reduction of stress. We pay attention to the world differently. We think differently. And we're very interested in uh, exactly what's going on with the restorative response. So in my lab, um, we have tried to study nature in kind of a perverse way. Uh, using virtual reality. So what you're looking at here, it's just a movie, but when we present this to participants, we, um, they see it in 3D and in, in full immersion, and the movement in the display is caused by their own movements. In other words, there's motion tracking. And psychologists are pretty good at making people feel bad, it turns out, so we begin by making people feel really bad, and then we immerse them in these kinds of environments, and we measure um, the effects of doing that, and lo and behold, without going through all of the details of this graph, I'll just tell you that after a brief uh, period of induction of stress, um, which is truly nasty, um, after 10 minutes of immersion in nature, people are restored to the state of equilibrium. Um, the real interest here is what the mechanism is for this. How is it that uh, this restoration takes place? And a lot of the ideas in this area revolve around uh, fractals. So, one idea uh, that comes from the work of Richard Taylor, um, for example, is that the, the, the trick is that the images of nature that are restorative, or the images that are restorative, will have the same fractal dimension as natural images. And his evidence for this is that if you measure the fractal dimension of a series of abstract panels and test for their restorativeness, you find that the most restorative abstract panels are those whose fractal dimension is around the same as the fractal dimension of real nature, which is remarkably consistent. And it's around 1.4, as you see in this, this image. Now, what's nice about that is that there's also, this is the last piece of, of um, uh, uh, what should I call this, neophrenology that I'll show you. Um, this is um, an image of an area of the brain called the parahippocampal gyrus, the parahippocampal place area more specifically. And the nice thing here is that this particular piece of the brain responds nicely to images of nature. It has a different response to images that restore than it does to images that don't restore. And the, uh, the right side of this image is meant to 
convey something else that's curious about this part of the brain, and that is that for reasons that we don't know, understand for sure yet, this area is rich in opiate receptors, naturally occurring opiate receptors. So if one waves one's arms around a bit in the absence of really strong evidence, you could make an argument that exposure to these natural scenes that produce a restorative response are producing a positive state in a way that may not be that different to the way that other kinds of things drive our behavior, things like food and sex, for example. Um, we are drawn to uh, the vitality of the world. We're drawn to the vitality of nature, to um, uh, the Beasley creations, and to a host of other kinds of, of things as well, um, I think, because we're hardwired to do so. Um, there was lots more, but I see it says, please conclude, so I'm going to. Thanks for listening. This does, however, allow a question. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned the fractal dimension of uh, images close to the fractal dimension of nature providing a restorative response. Have you been able to come up with a method of quantifying the fractal dimension of architecture or perhaps uh, layered on with different glazing? I, th I think it, it, using the methods that, um, and again, to be clear, the, the, the fractal work that I showed was not my work, but using the methods that Richard Taylor used, it wouldn't be hard at all to measure the fractal dimension of anything. It's a fairly basic mathematical method that you can apply to any kind of 2D image. Um, so yeah, you could, you could do that. The part of my talk that I didn't get to had to do a little bit with, with how one might go about thinking about things like the facades of buildings um, in terms of their approximation to, uh, to natural materials. The other caveat that I'll, that I'll just make if there's time is, is to say that not everybody would agree that um, it's the fractal dimension that's the real um, nub in here. There are other properties by which images of nature and images of other things differ that, that in our lab we think may end up being more important than, than fractal dimension, but that's a whole other story for another time. Is there a difference between an image of nature and a kind of an anthropocentric figuration, the abstraction of the, the kind of a, uh, is there a measure difference between the two? Is, so, sorry, so is there a... So you're, you're using simulated images of nature, right? It's yeah, kind of so is there something thing. special about actual nature as opposed to something else that has the same properties? Right. We okay. don't think so. Um, in fact, you can get restorative responses to... I didn't include the images in the set, but we've got some nice images that are completely devoid of any kind of traditionally understood nature. There's no vegetation in them. They're basically all bricks and concrete, and they are just as restorative as natural images because of the, the mathematical properties that the scenes actually have. 